Welcome to the podcast. This is Michael Easley, and it's a delight to have Dr. Kevin Zuber on the program today. Dr. Zuber is a professor of theology and chairman of the theology department at the Master Seminary, and he moved to L.A. from Chicago, Illinois. So if you have any questions about going from one frying pan to another, I guess you could ask Dr. Zuber. He was formerly a professor at the Moody Bible Institute for 17 years. He's also been in ministry here, there, and yonder, and we'll have all his information in the show notes, more about his Vita and CV. His PhD was earned from Trinity Evangelical Divinity School. He's married, and they have two sons, David and Christopher. Any any daughters-in-law or grandkids yet? Well, we have a, a daughter-in-law in waiting. The question hasn't been popped yet, but the date for the wedding has been set so i'm i'm not sure how that goes that's that's the 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 modern way i try is that the modern way okay and you've been in california how how long for folks that don't know about your transition kevin five years five years wow it's gone fast Mm -hmm. i was gonna guess three well we've got a new book called the essential scriptures a handbook of the biblical text for key doctrines plural and um First, before we, before we jump into this, uh, I always like to ask, why? Why did you write it? There are scores of books on theology, process theology, biblical, systematic, etc. So why another book on theology, Kevin? Well, that's a, that's a very good question. I think every author uh, has to feel that one, right? <laughs> Do we really need this? Well, in, uh, in one respect, it's because it's, it's a book on it's about systematic theology, but it's not another systematic theology. You know, we could uh, put up a pretty significant wall using uh, systematic theologies that are out there, you know, good ones and then others. But the, this book in particular was uh, uh, one that I, I think is unique in the sense that uh, it's geared just toward maybe the folks you were mentioning earlier before the show. Is there's people that may not pick up a th- a theology book or systematic theology sounds too intimidating, uh, but this is a book that covers all the doctrines. But the the significant difference uh, is that I don't try to be comprehensive, and the book itself is loaded with scripture. I mean, it's it's mostly a collection of the text. That's the title indicates essential scriptures, the key text, the key verses that. Uh, support or found a particular doctrine are actually printed many, many times in systematic theology. You get a, uh, a, a book that tells you here's the topic and then references. Uh, a venerable old book that I used many years ago was Major Bible Themes. It was uh, something that I used and you could have a, in that book, you could have one page, could be half of it, could be scripture references. You'd spend an afternoon looking up all that on one page. Uh, rather than try to be comprehensive like that, these are just, I have the texts right there. Uh, and then interspersed, there are certain texts, key, uh, even more key texts, that I do a little bit of exposition on and bring out what the text actually says so that uh, someone can actually see the connection. How did we get to that doctrine? You can put a doctrinal statement down. Uh, you know, the Holy Spirit is God. Uh, okay, where? how do you get to that? Uh, I put down the texts that have that make that reference, and then I do a little bit of exposition to show, well, this this is where it uh, demonstrates that uh, the Holy Spirit's a person and He's God, and uh, that way it it's the it's the gap I think between uh, someone that's uh, going to be a, a theologian and somebody that just wants to be a, a little bit more conversant on how to move from Scripture to doctrine. Let, let's talk a little bit. You said systematic theology, and uh, we have process theology, biblical theology, all these little adjectives that that describe this idea of doing theology. Why uh, why systematic versus biblical or process? Uh, good question. The the uh, a, a venerable uh, systematic theology that's out there I've used for years was is by Millard Erickson, and he has kind of a chart or a flow that says you move from exegesis, you, you move from the text, then you move up to uh, Bible doctrine. And there are a number of books out there that are like Bible doctrine type books. I think uh, Wayne Grudem's Systematic Theology is more of a Bible doctrine type book, just collecting the doctrines. And uh, Systematic Theology is uh, bringing 
all things together. So uh, you would comb through scripture, or ask question, uh, take another one, uh, the attribute of God's omniscience. You comb through scripture, you find all the verses that talk about that, and then you arrange them so that they, they're logically or thematically related, and you put that into a, a whole uh, system then of all the different doctrines. Biblical theology, uh, of course, all systematic theology should be biblical in one sense, hopefully, but uh, <laughs> but uh, biblical theology is a theology of zeroing in on, well, what's the theology of the Gospel of John? What's the theology of Isaiah? Uh, not trying to be comprehensive across uh, scripture. Uh, historical theology, obviously, what is, there's two ways to do that. Historical theology is just, again, take one doctrine and comb all the way through uh, Western uh, historical writing from the early church fathers all the way through through everybody, reformers, Puritans, everybody up to the current day. Or you take, uh, what did this era teach? What was the theology of this particular era? The fourth century was all about trying to figure out uh, the Trinity, the relationship of Christ, those kind of things. All, all of those things, biblical theology, historical theology, informs uh, systematic theology, ultimately. So there's some crossover there. Things like process theology is a modern form of methodology. of It's more philosophical theology uh, with a lot of philosophy tossed in. Uh, and that keeps growing in terms of uh, uh, identity groups. <laughs> so you have now uh, a feminist theology and uh, m different minority theologies. I also teach uh, in, I've taught quite a bit in Southeast Asia and still am teaching there via uh, the Zoom class, or actually an online class now. Uh, and so you could have... Uh, Asian theology or African theologies, again, and these are more ap application of the theology to a particular cultural uh, setting. Um, and we do the same thing when we do systematic theology in our context. You know, where does it apply? How does it apply to us? So uh, systematic is, uh, is I always like to say, uh, it, it's a systematic theologian has to know all of that. <laughs> The systematic theology guy has to know all of those kind of things. Biblical theology guy, he's just an expert on the Gospel of John, which is great. Uh, but then the, the historical theology guy, he doesn't even have to take a position. He just has to describe everything. You know, it's the easiest <laughs> one of all. Nobody can shoot at him because I'm just describing what was there. I don't have, I'm not taking a position. But systematic theology basically tries to cover all of that. So I have often taught people... Um, you need a Bible, you need a concordance, and you need what I call a single volume theology handbook. And like you, I probably have purchased way too many, uh, not only big sets, but individuals. And you mentioned one. Uh, of course, I love the one that Enns did back at uh, the Moody Handbook of Theology. Grudem's I always thought was too intimidating for the average person. It's just, you know, five times the size of a phone book, and they don't know how to approach that text. So I appreciate what you've done in a more condensed, not that there's not value in all of them. I'm kind of a theological handbook junkie, I guess, in some respect. But one, one thing that, that I have, and, and you differentiated biblical and systematic a little differently than I would, not right or wrong, but to me, biblical theology was rather uh, what we might call first first occurrences. So we look at the Abrahamic covenant, that sets a benchmark as opposed to the way you describe systematic, where we'd start with God, look up all the places God's mentioned, and then try to package it in some accessible form, as opposed to understanding the covenant of Abraham and how that unilateral covenant sets a platform for all the other covenants that follow. Am I wrong there? No, that's a, that's you're, you're right. I mean, again, all of these are categories that we have picked to sort of differentiate things but the, what you're describing i would describe as sort of a, a a form of biblical theology in the sense that you're tracing a theme all the way through scripture uh, the theme of the covenant the key theme of the promise as walter kaiser would put it and uh and certainly that that is something that uh, again you know derives go down to the bottom again, you drive from exegesis, you're looking at the text that comes up, you see it over and over again. You know, obviously the Abrahamic covenant, as you said, shows up over and over again in the Old Testament, key to the New Testament. Luke chapter one uh, shows that Mary's Magnificat, John's Benedictus, it's the Abrahamic covenant showing up. So 
that's a that's a, a theme that's there. So in that case, it isn't a theological topic. It's a it's a biblical theme that then you trace all the way through. So it's it's derived from the text, exegesis. It's a theme that shows up. So that's biblical theology, more streams of themes uh, than to than topics. And uh, but you do the same thing you, as a systematic theologian would do. You you look you're you're tracing out all the way that. That gets into a, another a form of biblical theology is uh, telling the story. So that's uh, also become very popular today to talk about biblical theology in terms of storylines. Uh, I think D. A. Carson basically was one that sort of helped to initiate that uh, more mainstream. But it goes back to uh, yeah quite a few. Uh, from your heritage back at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary and other places like that. Talk a little bit about um, the idea of doing theology, because we hear some of these, you know, and, and we could talk at length about the story. I have, I've almost gone to a knee-jerk, I don't want to use that word, because it's been so um, uh, reduced, almost a reductionist, what, your, what's your story? You know, it's almost a cliche, and we've taken away the, the story of God can sound trite, um, so just to you know, be careful with that. But but let's begin at the beginning. Why a person that says, "Oh, theology is for those eggheads like Dr. Zuber and Michael and these weird people that read the Bible a lot and they need to get out more." So talk about doing theology, what that means, and and why it's important that we think critically beyond just reading a story and going, "Oh, what's this mean to me?" Yeah. Uh, well, just to channel another uh, good uh, systematic theology that uh, has been around for a long time uh, by Charles Ryrie, uh, Biblical Theology, uh, published by Moody Press still. Uh, he basically starts out by saying, uh, look, everybody's a theologian. Uh, everybody, you know, if you read the Bible, you're going to be, a th you're doing theology, you know, you're, you're, you're processing the information and you're doing so from a, a particular worldview. You're doing, you're, you already have theological presuppositions you might not even be aware of, uh, the, the way it is, is uh, those need to be uh, confirmed, challenged, uh, enhanced, uh, articulated more clearly. You do that by reading scripture and putting things together. So everybody's, everybody's a theologian. Uh, I like to say I'm, I'm also a philosopher uh, in some of the other parts it's related. And I said everybody's a philosophy too, because everybody's got a philosophy, because everybody's got a worldview. Everybody starts somewhere. And the point is, is that you're going to be just thinking and putting things together is doing philosophy, putting things together related to God and his creation is doing theology. You're doing it now. You're going to do it well or you're going to do it poorly. Uh, so we want to do it well. And to do it well, you have to have the right source. So the, the Bible, you could start with your own thinking and just contemplate your navel and uh, try to think about God. And that's not going to get you a lot of places. So you start with the Bible. Doing theology is is what I said earlier. You do exegesis. This this is where it is. Exegesis, uh, and I I try to put exposition, expositional thinking, if not preaching. I try to put that at a very early part. So you you do theology by looking at a text of scripture, figuring it out. What's what's being said? How does it relate to its context? Uh, what does it say uh, about the topic? Uh, What's what's the intent of the author? This is all hermeneutics. You move from that, so you 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 put that you, you classify you got that all done. So you put that down and you pick up another one and you get another text and another text. Once you have a string of these texts, you say, well, how do these texts relate to one another? Uh, how are they relating? Always again keeping in mind again the author's original intent, uh, what the text is actually saying. Try to. Am I putting my own ideas in there or am I driving this from the text again? You'll find out things get corrected, particularly if you're going back and forth in Pauline writings or you're going the, the New Testament's use of the Old Testament. Your ideas get refined. And those things are the things that then uh, you put together in such a way that uh, you have uh, a coherent idea about, uh, again, a, a topic, systematic theology or whatever. This goes on. I mean, it never stops. You, you're constantly refining that. It never finishes. And, you know, uh, we were cautioned in uh, seminary about don't you know, selective passive theology, that you piece together this system based on 
you know, you talked about context and how critical it is. What did it mean in John's gospel? What did it mean in Genesis chapter 15, 17, 8, 19? And we have to be careful to keep that mooring before we jump and connect it to something else. And I appreciate in your introduction, you, you laid out a scheme that I think is the delicate balance for most today because we toss these words reformed around a lot. We've kind of vilified fundamental and evangelical, and, and those are those are fairly deep conversations. And as always, nomenclature gets repurposed and misused. And, you know, to me, evangelical is a great word. Fundamental is a great word. Fundamentalism can have some, you know, hair on, you know, on, on your shoe, gum on your shoe. And, and so we have to be careful with this. You, you begin by saying uh, you're reformed in your soteriology, but then you break a little bit with more reformed thinking. And you talk about pre-mill, pre-trib, a literal, a literal reign. So, so again, helps some folks are are well aware of these arguments. So, help them understand what it means when you say I'm reformed soteriologically. Well, I'm a I'm a Calvinist. Uh, so, you know, I've 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 tossed this around back and forth. Uh, I'm a Calvinist in that uh, I, you know, the five points of Calvinism, which no real reform person likes because that's just you know a way of saying i'm not arminian <laughs> and uh well let, let me interrupt for just a second there because calvinism the five points were not calvin that's a response to the the dort you know council of dort and 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 even the language that was used wasn't calvin's language it was you know what what you can refer to arminianism and it was even the the back and forth synonyms and antonyms were because of what the heresy was coming into the church. And I remind people all the time, there was one church and it was Catholic. Now that church had different geopolitical emphases, whether it was in, you know, Germany or Switzerland and so forth. But we're pretty cavalier sometimes when we say I'm a five point Calvinist. I go, wait a minute. Calvin wasn't a five point Calvinist. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly my point. You know, so you you're you're you, you nailed it because again, you know, uh, you know, I don't want to be defined by what I disagree, how I disagree with other people. Okay. Uh, in fact, that's going to be a very long list. Okay. I'm this because I'm not that I'm this because I'm not that I'm this, you know, that's, that's going to take me forever. So reform puts me more on the not Lutheran, but Calvin side of reform reformation soteriology, uh, that has, a heritage that runs, I think, more through uh, uh, Puritanism, not totally either there. So, uh, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying to identify myself. And I made it point, as you saw in the, in the preface there, that I'm not, it's not capital R, because I'm not going with a reform system. I'm not going with one of, I mean, I appreciate the reformed uh, confessions, you know, Heidelberg, Belgic, even Westminster, you know, uh, I profit from them. Uh, in fact, I've, I've, I do, I do some regular devotional reading out of the uh, Common Book of Prayer. Okay, so I mean, I'm pretty well, and I, I remind people all the time those were in contexts, and you know, it's just like a, when you go to a church. Hopefully, you look at their statement of faith or their doctrinal statement, whatever they call it. That's written in a context. Uh, sometimes it's piecemeal from other churches, but oftentimes it's, you know, for example, in the last 20 years, we've had to put a doctrinal statement that has definition of a family <laughs> because things have changed. And you, you and gender, you better have a comment on gender and family and what marriage is and isn't. So these weren't, at, they, these weren't debated in the 14th century. You know, that was, it was a given. So whenever we read those confessions, I just interviewed um, Phil Carey on his book on the Nicene Creed. And extraordinary little short creed, but we talked at length about the context of why those things were put together. They're not scripture, but they were valuable in that place and time to understand this is what's going on. And again, I think when a, a lot of seminary grads are very naive and very guilty to use these terms in a cavalier fashion, well, they're not reformed. They're not five point. And I go, wait a minute. You probably don't even know what that means when you're saying that. And that's why I appreciated your introduction to say a reformed soteriology is, well, I'll let you let you define it. What does it mean to have a 
soteriology is just how we were saved. And you say, okay, I'm reformed in my view of soteriology. Yeah, I, I, I think again in my soteriology, uh, uh, again from from a, a venerable theologian, J.I. Packer, uh, God saves sinners. God does it. Uh, God chose me in eternity past. Uh, Christ died for me. Uh, Holy Spirit, the one that applies the uh, the the saving work of Christ to me. Uh, I certainly, you know. That, that old song, I have decided to follow Jesus. There should be a chorus. Uh, I have decided to follow Jesus, and thank God he 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 moved me to yeah you know he did I give all of that. So it's just that's my reform soteriology is is and that goes all the way through. I don't keep myself either. I mean I'm I'm uh, I don't really like the once saved always saved. That's sort of like a, a get out of hell free card. Uh, on a pair of asbestos underwear and you just, you know, stand as close to, to hell as you can and live like the way, but God's going to get you anyway. Now, uh, perseverance is a better way to put that. So I'm all of that. I don't think you can lose your salvation. I think God is the one who initiated it by sovereign election. Uh, again, Ryrie's got a very good, good chapter on election there that I've often used and surprises people that are quote unquote reformed. They say, where are you getting that? Well, that's Charles Ryrie, believe it or not. Uh, and, you know, we, we believe that. So those are the those are the elements that uh, basically God saves sinners. God is the one that uh, called. Christ died. Holy Spirit applies. That's what I that's what I try to uh, illustrate when I baptize people. You know, in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. Why? Because I believe in believers' baptism, uh, and not uh, uh, because God is the one that saves sinners. That see, that's where the thing. You, like you're right. The labels don't really fit then, because when I start talking and you know, believers of baptism, then the more, you know, hardcore reformed, you know, they, they get itchy about that sort of thing. So I, I tried, I tried to make it clear whether it's because, it, and you know, that's, I, I try not to be great controversies and just try to be create clarity. Uh, and I know that when anybody that picks up the book, you know, in a bookstore or something like that and reads through that, or the, you know, the little, uh, look inside thing on Amazon and they see that they say, uh, uh, you know, okay. Uh, he, Up or down? Yeah, they're gonna say, they're gonna make a quick. The uh, the uh, the other part, uh, the more dispensational part. You know. Well, well, talk to me a little bit about this because you're teaching at the Master Seminary, which is is obviously a renowned uh, school, and there's got to be divergence. I you know when I was at Dallas. We had we were accused of being pre mill dispensational seven point three whatever, and I, I would always say I had to study all of it. I had to read Lorraine Bettner. I had to read B.B. Warfield. I had to read Chafer. And it wasn't this rubber stamp that, oh, you will be now a, you know, three or seven, you know, dispensation uh, person and God saves differently at different times. That wasn't what I was taught. But that label gets stuck on you. I mean, I probably like you have reformed friends that have disavowed me because I went to Dallas A. And because I would take a view of limited, I would lean with unlimited atonement. And you mentioned perseverance, which I want to have you define a little bit, because I find that is the most misunderstood part of the so-called tulip. Um, because it sounds like I have to continue persevering and good works and demonstrating my faith, and I can't backslide, or I never really was saved. And that's not the doctrine at all, right? Right, yeah. Perseverance is... Uh you know, is a promise made by God that, you know, he will complete the work. You know, he has begun a good work and you will perform it until the day of Christ. And for us, it's a, uh, it's, a, I always said perseverance as a doctrine is helpful only in the sense that you get up every morning and say, today I will persevere. I mean, uh, it's, it's a promise that God has made for the future. It's a, it's an admonition for us to, to uh, keep going. And if we look to the past, uh, we look back and say, God has brought about my perseverance. Again, it's all God's the one that saves sinners. So perseverance, you know, you know, I I dislike the idea of some that you know, well, once again, once saved, always saved. You know, go go live like you want. You're gonna be okay. No, that'd be and but but once saved, always saved is a true positional relationship. And we're justified by faith. There's therefore not further condemnation. But if I go live like you know, uh, uh, I wasn't saved. I'm no longer a slave to sin that I should obey its lust, right? But at the same time, 
that there's got to be the assurance of eternal security, or we're back to being Armenian. Right. Well, that's it. I mean, that's the, that's the point. The assurance, like I say, the perseverance is a promise that God has made that I will persevere. So that's the future one. Uh, okay, I'm going to push you on that. You're saying that I will persevere? or Because I thought the pure Reformed was the Holy Spirit will persevere in me. Yeah, well, I think it's both. I think the point is is that uh, the work that God is working is outworking you. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, you know, work out your salvation with fear and trembling for it is God who works in you. So it's interesting that Paul puts that in that order, right? Work out your salvation with fear and trembling. You know, why wouldn't he put, you know, for God is at work in you, therefore work it out. Okay. No, it's, it's that the, the admonition comes first. You know, you, you, like I say, look at yourself every day. I will persevere today. There's an element of, of, uh, you know, a promise that God has made in the future. Okay. I can, there's my assurance, Romans eight, you know, the end of that chapter, but it's a matter of, uh, yeah, I need to get up and employ the means of grace every day. Uh, this is this is why I do. This is why I read the Bible every day. This is why I, I pray and, and make my little prayer list every day. And uh, this I do it. I'm the one that's called upon to do it. But it's God who is doing that in me. But that doesn't assure or ensure our salvation. No, no, God's promise does. But what? And I'm supposed to I'm supposed to do that. Well, this is the obedience part. This this to me is Ephesians two ten. You know, it's the most neglected verse in our salvation ideology is that, yeah, yeah, but you're prepared to, uh, God's prepared things for us to live and do and breathe. And, and the other part about faithful obedience, we often talk about once saved, always saved and sort of a easy believism, but to understand what that means, I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in the son of God. So there is an activity not just a passive Christian life. I think that's it. The is, once saved, always saved, I think. Like we were saying about the other things, you know, we have to be careful that, you know, some people that don't really understand the nuances that you've just uh, articulated about that uh, do kind of turn it into an easy believism. This is this is my whole point in the book, even, is that I'm trying to think about people that don't normally think through issues or definitions as carefully as we might and what they will take from that. And as a pastor for many years... Uh, it was like, uh, you know, I had my son, you know, made a profession of faith in camp when he was in, a teenager and he's good. <laughs> Where's he at now? Well, he's in jail, but he's OK. No, those are the kind of things, you know, you have to follow through. Let's talk about some of the the topics because you did a rather condensed uh, text for a reason, I think. Right. To make it accessible. And we used to talk about the big eight in theology and, and talk about why you chose some of these, Kevin. Somebody asked me, well, how long did it take you to write that book? And I said, uh, let's say about 40 years. Seriously, because I started preaching, uh, you know, and uh, I'm using all of that that I learned in seminary uh, that I learned. I mean, not that I had mastered, but I, I'd learned it and realized, oh, I have to do this. And then teaching for the years I did at Moody, I taught systematic theology. And I taught that was because you had to teach uh, one and two, there were two sections and you had to be able to teach everything across their sections. And it was already on the curriculum. So I basically followed them. Then when I got here, uh, the book that is the, the standard for us is a big book called Biblical Doctrine, which ironically is more of a systematic theology, but uh, that was uh, compiled by the uh, professors and, uh, uh, and pastors at Grace Church. And it's the seminary, Biblical Doctrine. And so I wanted to make my book uh, dovetail uh, with that one because we kind of use it here as a again as a supplementary text so if we're studying out of biblical doctrine then we can use that uh, we can use my book kind of as a guide for that in fact now I'm helping to edit the the what we call adventure club it's an Awana type uh, program and we're using biblical doctrine as the outline but we're referring to my book to make sure we got the right verses and stuff. So uh, that's, that's, so that's the, that's the basic topic, but they're the standard ones in many respects. They're the ones that uh, you would expect to see in any systematic theology. So I wanted to make it so somebody using my book wouldn't need or didn't have an indication that they would go to a larger one, larger systematic theology, but to be able to navigate uh, through those things if they did. So they'd have an introduction to them already. When, uh, as, as you've taught now for culmination, 40 plus years, give me the top, well, I hate to always say the top two, three, but 
common things you see where people really have their theology wrong, where they, they need help? I'll, I'll try to pick a couple from different areas. The first, I would say, is uh, it's ironic that you said you just uh, talked to Phil Carey because I have his book, but I haven't actually read it yet because I've done a lot of studies on fourth century and, and Trinitarian stuff. But I would say that um, most people really have a, a strange view of the Trinity when you start getting into it. And that becomes, you know, they don't really know how the Trinity works. And uh, along with that, they don't know how the two natures of Christ work. And they get some bizarre ideas. Just to get an example, there's a text in the, the Olivet Discourse where Jesus says, uh, "The you know, the, no one knows the time of the Son of Man to return, not even, you know, not even the Son of Man himself or something like that, paraphrasing. And so people, well, how does that work? He knows everything. He's God. He's omniscient. And uh, and they and so you have these things. Well, you know, he he decided to forget. You know, technical term coming. They they have sort of a weird kenosis view. They don't even know they have a weird kenosis view. But uh, you know, I, I I tell them, well, that's the kenosis. You're you're off. And, you know, their mind. You know, their eyes glaze over. I that's right. But well, and and for folks that don't know, kenosis is from Philippians two, where he emptied himself and took the form of a bond servant. And so he would say he is self limiting. In his glory, he's self-limiting in what he does. He doesn't act apart from the Father's will, right? So, right. So he, how does that work? So how, how people keep asking me how it works. And I've been on kind of a crusade for a long time to try and say, I think what happens is we get it wrong. This is a good example. We get it wrong by thinking we kind of already know how a divine human would work. Uh, how, do, how would a God-man work? Well, I kind of know how that would work. And then we read the text and we go, well, that doesn't work. Uh, you know, the point is, is he doesn't toggle back and forth between divine nature, human nature, divine nature. A, a nature doesn't have a person. A person has a nature and he has two natures. And if you ask how it works, uh, read the text. That's how it works. OK, uh, you, you can't get into the inner workings uh, of, of that because we'd have to be God in, on the God side. We know how the human side works. So I try to sort of help people understand um, that. And that's where, like, going back through Nicene Creed on the Trinity, Chalcedon, the Council of Chalcedon, on, and walk through that. Well, why did they pick those terms? What do those? What were they trying to avoid? What were they trying to say? Um, so that's one. Another one is, um, with again, with respect to... Uh, uh, let's pick one. We we did we already talked about sanctification, uh, perseverance. You know, in terms of election, that's another one that's difficult for people because uh, they have typically the I mean the Arminian notion of God looking down the corridors of time and seeing who's going to believe and all that kind of stuff. That that makes sense to them, okay? Until I say, well, wait a minute. In that case, history happens twice, and God learns something. The first. Well, yeah, and our 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 behavior affects God's election, which you know. Oh, Kevin's going to be a really good guy when he's 56, so I'll choose him. Well, yeah, that's what I always say. No, Kevin looks down the line. God looks down the quarter of the time and says, oh, my, myself, if I, if, I, uh, if, uh, if I could save him, I'm going to be a great God because there's, there's, a, there's something. So those are the kinds of things, again, um, and a lot of it, again, has to do with reading the Bible with preconceived notions that they don't even know they have. And then that's where the questions come up. These are the questions. It's good. How does that work? You know, they look at the Bible. Well, how does that work? Because so the first thing you have to do is sort of uh, untangle those preconceptions and say, well, what makes you think that? What makes you say that? Why would you why would you think that that's a problem? And uh, usually it takes more than once. There was one dear lady in my last church before I moved out here uh, and she, you know, I was preaching through Matthew and just about every other Sunday morning, it was like, well, wait a minute. How could Jesus say that? How could he do that? And it's like, okay, but what Jesus are you talking about? These are former Catholics and they are just, you know, they have this, you know, a strange view of Jesus, you know, that a lot of those problems I discovered it made, made sense to me after a while. A lot of the problems they had with understanding Jesus were resolved by saying, well, that's Mary. So, you know, take that out of Jesus and give it to Mary. And then they go, okay, well, this is a whole separate person. So <clears throat> Jesus can be ultra divine and his human nature is much downplayed. And then uh, Mary fills in the gaps of uh, some of those kind of things. And so, well, that, so <clears throat> that's where that, those are the kind of the, the, the major sort of issues and, and things. 
I, one of the things, just it, a little off topic, but not too much. When I first started pastoring, I was taught expository preaching at Grace Seminary. Uh, in fact, I was a very young Christian when I started college and seminary there, so I didn't know. I'd never been exposed to expository preaching. Uh, and uh, this is how you do it, Greek, Hebrew, uh, you know. You know, I got tear stains on my first year Greek text, like, you know, I'll never master this. But I did, by God's grace, and I had, and I used it, because I didn't know other way to make a sermon. You mastered it by God's grace. Okay. You... Yeah, there it is. So the point is, is that, uh, and I thought, well, this is it, you know, this, they're going to, they're going to recognize this. And I recognized that uh, every pastor that I had would take two years for them to really understand expository preaching. They didn't really understand what I was doing. And uh, but once people had had gained a taste for it and appreciation for it, they could never go back. I had one fellow that 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 left to go study uh, marketing at, in uh, Wisconsin University of Wisconsin, and for months it was like uh, you've ruined me. I can't find a church. There's, nobody does this. How come you did this? Why did why, you know? So uh, and and again, that's just uh, the application of. Uh, of the scriptures to, you know, the needs of a congregation. That's exactly what I do. Interesting you bring up uh, the Trinitarian confusion. And, of course, we're in Tennessee, and there are a number of modalist and uh, other, you know, sort of um, unfortunate views of the Trinity. And I, I, I always go back to, um, now I just lost the passage, First Corinthians Twelve seven or fourteen seven, where he says the same uh, same Lord, same God, same Spirit, the effects, the the gifts, and the ministries. And I go, it's a very clear passage. Interestingly, it doesn't show up in a lot of theology handbook handbooks because it doesn't. That's a pretty clear passage that there is a Trinitarian Godhead. And I remember it uh, when I was at Moody teaching through the doctrinal statement there, and uh, it, it dawned on me. I should have learned it earlier in life, but I didn't. There's no salvation apart from a Trinitarian Godhead. That's right. Yeah. And and that's what, yeah. And, and that was like, oh, well, forget some of the complexities of what we do and don't understand. If you don't have a Trinitarian Godhead, you cannot be saved. And boy, it, it, it begins to open things up, but you're right. And I, I think that's a good mark of a pastor. If he spoils his congregation that they can go and discern somewhere Oh, uh, this guy really hasn't done his homework, or maybe he wasn't trained, or whatever the case might be. And not to be pretentious or arrogant, but just to say, look, the Scripture is uh, is a wonderful, complex, um, always worth our time uh, document. And uh, and doing theology, which I hate the cliche, but that that's really where it is, isn't it? Because you're you, you've used the term exegesis a lot, and people may be unfamiliar with that, but it's a careful study of the. We might say the grammar, the language, not to take it out of people's hands, but understand that context, understanding why Paul wrote it, why John wrote it, why Luke wrote it, and then backing out a little bit and say, what's the point in that context, that setting? You know, What was Nicodemus supposed to understand? What are we supposed to understand? And the exposition is the, the clear communication, we would say, of what the Bible is saying. And so our job is as a pastor, teacher, Sunday school teacher, is trying to say, let me do some of the heavy lifting and let me explain it to you so we all can understand it. Now, we can go deep. We can make it simple for kids, but it's a living word. And the only way I'm going to be on the rails in a good way is theology. That's what I try to do. I mean, I always try to, I would, I, I tell my students here now, I said, look, when you're you're going to have to use all of the tools we gave you. You're going to have to go through all of that. The theology is going to be there. I said, but you don't bring all that to the message. That's all That's all stuff you, you want to make sure that you just make sure you ex explain the text with all of those other kinds of things. In, uh, so you're using theology. You're doing theology. And I always try to, you know, I, I told him, I said, you know, my, my definition of a good preacher is, uh, a good sermon is, is the end of the sermon. People go, oh, that's clear. Uh, I get it. If, if they come out at the end, <clears throat> uh, uh, somebody says uh, to the, you know, I always told the students, you know, when people came to me and said, wow, I never would have seen that. Uh, you know, it was, they meant it as a compliment. Wow, that was great because I never would have seen that. But that means they still don't. Okay. <laughs> or, or, or we've taken it out of their hands. And that's always been my fear. And when, when if you or I or anybody dazzles them, I never knew that. I never saw it. 
it kind of cuts two ways. Either they're learning or I've done something that's taken the Bible away from them. And it's like, well, I've got to go listen to this person before I understand. I want them to feel like even if they couldn't, because I had all the tools that I didn't exhibit, uh, I want them to feel like they read that text and they go, yeah, I probably could have gotten that on my own if I was, if all I had to do is work one hour a week. Uh, <laughs> and my, my epitaph has always been, if it's not clear that a person could hear what I say and, and look at the, oh, yeah, I see how he got that. That to me is, and maybe that's not the best, but that was always my litmus was, sure, I want to teach and educate. I use the phrase sidebar. Let me take a sidebar. And I might talk about election. I might talk about predestination. I might talk about, you know, a dispensation if it really was important in that passage. But then I t technically say, okay, let's go back to the main part of this because you're going to have that, I call it the bell curve in the audience. Those who know a lot about the Bible, those who know nothing about the Bible. And I do think it's incumbent on the Sunday school teacher, the pastor, to understand that when he looks at the audience to say, these are God's people. I want to be clear so when they learn it maybe the first time or they relearn it or reinforces it, oh, I see where Dr. Zuber got that from in John 15. Yeah, but you first of seldom actually accomplish that goal. Let, let me let me jump toward your last section where you, you're going to talk obviously about future times. I love the fact that you spend some time on angelology. I think this is so important because we have so much bad information on that. But um Land the plane for us in the last couple of minutes. Why would a person pick up this book, uh, Essential Scriptures? So basically you've cobbled together key passages that they can understand these header topics that we might say, oh, I've heard those words before. This is how we get there. Well, that's it. I mean, the, the I you just mentioned about how there's a wide spectrum of you having your you know audience when you're when you're preaching or teaching. And uh, I understood that, you know, for the book as well. So it's not written for, you know, high level systematic theologians, uh, except <laughs> it might be a reminder to, hey, wait a minute. OK, don't forget this, these these texts. Don't forget, you know, how you got to these uh, higher things. You, they, they weren't delivered by golden parachute to you in particular. No, golden plates, golden plates. Uh, and also uh, the, you know, the the person that's just, you know, they hear soteriology or the terms that we've used here, you know, even angelology. OK, I know what angels are, but what's angel? You no, know, it's so that they would have an introductory sort of a definitional, you know, grounding on those kind of things. And uh, and then through it, through the middle, too, in terms of, uh, again, back to how do you get from the text to those doctrines? OK, now, this isn't. You know, in particular, I do the excursies and the little uh, expositions. That's I'm showing, again, more showing how it's done. I don't, I, it's not exhaustive, but that's the way I teach as well. I mean, I don't teach systematic theology of here's the outline and then we just here's the here's a statement, here's a few texts, here's a statement, here's a text. I intersperse exposition. I preach to my classes. Ha always have. You know, this is a this is a text like, for instance, uh, you know, uh, a text on. Uh, personal eschatology okay here's the here's lazarus the rich man and lazarus and i preach through that text now what does this tell us you know what's it intending to tell us you know the chamber rooms of the afterworld or something like that no it's supposed to tell us something about you know the inevitability of our own personal eschatology and the implications of that in terms of how we've either been devoted to god or not you know in life so th those are the kinds of things i'm trying to do so yeah, it's 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 an exercise in which again, uh, uh, it was actually the, the it, I I know I don't know everything, and so I tried to make sure I put in about one quarter or less of what I do know into the book just so that I'm safe. Okay, no one can say, well, there's more to say. Well, of course I know there's more to say, but uh, and you still haven't you know, gotten into the realm of things I don't know, which would be a huge book, okay, of the realm of things I don't know. And I've been very happy, too, because, you know, I, I, I've i gotten quite, a, you know, the, the feedback I've got for the best feedback are from pastors who said, I use this for my men's group. 
you know, these guys heard me using terminology and they said, oh, we finally understand what you're talking about now. And I'll, or, uh, or I've gotten people that, uh, you know, for, even former students and they, uh, a number of them has said, uh, I'm, I'm glad I got this book because I didn't take very good notes in your class and now I have it all. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's very gratifying. So uh, I'm happy that, uh, you know, Moody made their money back. Uh, so uh, it, it's, it's uh, moderately successful. So uh, that, that was the main objective. Dr. Kevin Zuber, his new book called The Essential Scriptures, a handbook of biblical text for key doctrines. As always, the information in the show notes, if you didn't catch what we're talking about, you can look and read it and copy and paste that and find out where any place you can buy a book, you can probably grab a copy of it. Kevin, always great to talk to you. Appreciate your ministry and hard work and uh, blessings on your uh, on your semester. Thanks very much, and we'll be looking forward to what the Lord's going to keep using you for for many years. Amen. Did you know that In Context is fully funded by our listeners like you? If you are a regular listener, would you consider giving a one-time or perhaps monthly donation? You can give at michaelincontext.com. In Context is produced by Hannah Seymour, mixed and mastered by Sonomorphic, and music composed by Tycho and Blair Masters.